Today, I want to talk about the stack, the call stack, what it is, how it's used, and what a stack overflow is. Hey, welcome back. Happy holidays, everybody. Whatever holiday you're celebrating. Today, I want to spend a little time talking about the stack. Now, this is something that usually comes up a little in your first year computer science class, but I still get a lot of issues with it with juniors and seniors. And so I thought it was a good topic to talk about. And of course, when I ask students, what is a Stack Overflow? The answer usually is, isn't it that website that I use to get all that help on all my projects? And yeah, it is. And for some of you, that's become quite a crutch. Maybe that's something we'll talk about in a future video. But the point is, that's not the Stack Overflow we're talking about in this video. This video will have code as always. The code is available through Patreon. Thank you all who support this channel. I really appreciate your help. So now let's move on to the stack. The stack is the place in memory where your local variables and your function are arguments go. You see, typically your program's address space looks something like this. Code and global variables typically go down here at the bottom in the lower addresses. These sections are static. They just sit here. They don't get bigger or smaller. But then we have two sections that do change. The heap down here at the bottom is where we keep our memory chunks that you allocate with malloc, calloc, realloc, new, if we're using C++. And up here is the stack and your local variables and program arguments go up here. And we put them at opposite ends so that they have room to grow. The heap is going to grow upward as you use more and more memory, and the stack is going to grow down. And today I just want to explore a little bit about how this works, particularly looking at the stack. You see, every time you call a function, a chunk of memory is added to the top of the stack. Well, it feels like the bottom of the stack because it's growing down, but it's a stack. I have a video on that just in case you're not sure what a stack is, but we always add stuff to the top. So this is a stack that's turned upside down. You get the picture. It's an upside down stack. But this chunk of memory down here that we added for a function call is called its stack frame. And it holds the arguments and the local variables for this function call. It also stores the return address, basically the place in code where you should jump back to when the function is finished. So when your main function is called, it gets one of these stack frames. If main calls a function like say printf, then printf gets its own stack frame. And if printf calls another function, that function gets a stack frame. And hopefully you get the idea. And when a function returns, then we just pop the stack. We remove its stack frame. We remove all the stuff that was on there. Well, we don't really remove it. We just move the stack pointer. That's the thing that marks the top of the stack. And then when another function is called, we just overwrite the old stack frame with new stack frames. So that's pretty straightforward conceptually. Now let's take a look at some code. Because I always think one of the best ways to really understand a concept in computing is to play around with it in code. Okay, so let's start off with a super simple program with just a main function. I also have a make file over here, pretty simple. It just compiles this program. Check out my make videos if you need a refresher there. I'll put a link in the description. Now, let's just take a look back in this program and try to get an idea of where our stack is. Okay, now there isn't really a portable standard way to do this in C, sadly, but there are a few tricks that I can use. One common way to get a sense of where things are or just to print out the address of a local variable. So I can just declare a local variable i here. I'm not really gonna do anything with it, but then we can just print it out. We can print out its address and say main percent %p. If you haven't seen that, that just means we're, pr we're printing out an address. We're printing out a pointer. And let's just print out the address of i. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. We could do that. We know that the address of i is going to be close to the top of the stack. Now, when using GCC or Clang, we do have one other option. I'm gonna add that in here really quick. And that is this built-in frame address. And basically what this is doing is it's just printing out the frame pointer and the frame pointer is also going to be close to the top of the stack. Okay, so now we can come in here and compile it and we can run it. And you can see, okay, we got two addresses. They're not quite the same. They are close to each other. They're both high in the address range. So we can see that, yeah, we're getting different addresses. The address of i is closer to the top of the stack where the frame pointer is not quite there. It's basically giving us the bottom of the current stack frame. Okay, so now just to prove that it's a stack, let's try to make it stack. Let's see how it stacks up. I'm gonna do this by just making a new function. Let's give it an argument. I'm gonna call it counter, why not? Um, doesn't really matter at this point. I'm also going to give it a local variable. Let's set that equal to five because we can, why not? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take this and we're gonna print out our addresses in here as well. And we're going to print out the address of result 
Let's also print out the address of counter just so you can see where that gets placed. We'll need another percent P in here. And now of course we need to come down into main and actually call our new function. Let's pass in an integer here, whatever, just so we can see. When we're looking at memory, this will allow us to like, we can see where the four is, we can see where the five is. And then let's finish up there. Also, I'm gonna get a warning here if I'm not careful. So let's just return zero. Now let's compile it. And now we can run our program again. And you see, okay, we got some more addresses. If you look at these addresses, you'll notice that sure enough, it is growing. Our stack is, is growing. Our frame pointer keeps getting smaller. The addresses are moving down um, as you add a new one. You also notice that yes, the address of result is the one that seems to come first, followed by the address of the argument. So it looks like we're getting the local variables first followed by the arguments that are being passed in. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But now at this point, I wanna just take a second to actually look at the memory and see how things are being organized. Okay, to do this, I want to get it into a debugger. I'm currently working on my Mac, and so I'm going to use LLDB because I don't currently have GDB installed. I haven't got it working well on my Mac yet. If I was on Linux, I would be using GDB. And what I wanna do here is just step into this function call and then look at the memory around the stack. So we can just, Set a breakpoint in main. We'll run to that point. Okay, great, we're here. Let's just step through. Well, sorry, use next to step over and now to step in. Okay, now we're calling my function. Okay, we're here. Let's set our local variable. We'll just go through the printf. Okay, so at this point you've seen we have the addresses that were all printed out. So we have a sense of where the top of our stack is. Now at this point, I just wanna show you a couple of things. First thing is you can use the BT command, that's the backtrace command. And what that does is it basically goes back through the stack and gives you a trace of the function calls that got you here. Okay, this is just kind of useful to see that yeah, sure enough, we're in my function. It tells us where we are in the function. That function was called by main. It tells us where in main the call occurred and main was started by start. And I mentioned this in a few of my other videos. Sometimes it's a surprise to some students that main isn't actually where your program starts. Start is where your program starts. Uh, main just is called by start and that's where your code starts running. But there's actually a lot that happens before your code starts running. But the reason I show you this is that looking at stack traces is just really handy for helping you see how you got where you are. So like if you're tracking down a bug, you're just like, how did I even get here? At least you can see who called who to get to where you are. And so this is great, but I wanna take this a step further and actually examine the memory on the stack. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the X command to examine 128 bytes, sorry. And the address we're going to examine at, let's just start at the beginning. Let's start at the address of result here. So what this is saying is, it's saying basically show me the bytes, 128 bytes starting at this address, this seven F F E E F whatever. So, so I'm gonna do that. This gives us a big wall of hex. Don't panic, please. All it's doing is showing us the individual bytes in hexadecimal. And I wanted to show you this just so you can see how things are being laid out. Okay, so right here you can see our five, right? That's the result variable. So our, our, our variable result, our local variable is being stored right here at this address at the beginning of the stack. Okay, next in memory, you can see the four. This is counter. This is that argument that was passed in. You remember we passed it in with the value four, that makes sense. So the next thing you have stored on the stack right here is actually the frame pointer. Now you notice if you come back up here, you notice the address we printed out, this is the address of the frame pointer. And the frame pointer is here really just to help us keep track of where the different frames begin and end. And it's really useful when we wanna say, print out our own stack trace. Do let me know if you'd be interested in seeing that in a follow on video, but wait one moment. The big question right here is how do I know what's what and what's put where on the stack? How do we know where arguments go and locals and frame pointers and that's a good question. And this depends on the calling convention that you're using. There are a lot of different ways you can organize data on the stack. For example, when a function returns, we could require that function to clean up its own stack information. It could pull off all of its own locals and everything. It could clean up its own stack frame, or that could be the job of the calling function. We could put the arguments first, we could put the locals first, or really there are a lot of different ways that this could be managed. And if you're writing your own handcrafted assembly programs, 
you really can manage the stack however you like. But this becomes a little problematic when I want my code to play well with others. If I want the code I write to work with the code you write, or the code in a pre-compiled system library or something, you give me some library, it's already compiled, there's a binary, and I want to call functions in that library, then we need to organize our data in a consistent way. So that's why we have calling conventions. And there are a lot of different calling conventions. Here I'm listing just a few. If you want to go into specifics into some of these, maybe we can discuss this in a future video. But the point is, is that if we both follow the convention rules, then my functions can call your functions and everything's going to work fine because we're making the same assumptions about how the stack is being managed. And like I said, there's a lot more that I could say about the stack, how things are organized on the stack, but time is short. And before we wrap up, I did want to look at stack overflows because I told you we would talk about them. So simply put, a stack overflow is just when we allow our stack to get too big and when we overflow the memory that the operating system is willing to give us. So let's do that really quickly. The easiest way I can think of to do that is to come up to my function and let's just call itself. So if I come up to my function and say, let's just, in case we wanted to play around with it, let's just increment the counter by one. That's cool. Now, what this is going to do is it means that when I call my function, my function is going to call my function and that call to my function is going to call my function. And each of these is going to keep putting something on the stack. And so the stack is just going to grow infinitely until it eventually dies. The operating system says you can't have any more memory and sorry, I'm going to crash your program. It's going to segfault. Okay, so let's get out of our debugger really quick. And now it is going to warn us. Our compiler is smart enough to say, hey, Jacob, you've just got infinite recursion. This is going to end badly. Fortunately for us, for demonstration purposes, that's just a warning so I can keep going. But if you see this in your programs in the future, note that this is what it's telling you. It's telling you your stack is gonna grow and eventually you're gonna have an overflow problem. But for now, we will be undeterred and we will just march along and run our program. And what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a ton of addresses this is just gonna basically dump addresses as the stack grows. And at some point, our stack grows down so far that we run out of space. We run off the memory that was mapped for our stack and then it seg faults. The operating system says, I don't know what you're doing, but I don't like it. Now, one thing to point out is this took a while for me to overflow the stack. That's because each of my stack frames right now are pretty small. One little exercise to try at home is if you try to add a lot of local variables or just add a big array, add like a, an array of 10,000 elements, you're gonna notice that it doesn't take nearly as many function calls to overflow the stack. And that's because each of your stack frames are so much bigger. So your stack is gonna grow much faster. That's one reason and also why often people will discourage you from having really big local variables, especially on embedded systems that have limited amounts of memory, because this can cause your stack to grow really fast and that can cause overflows. And okay, so naturally in practice, you don't want to do this. You don't want to stack overflow, but I hope this helps you all see how the stack works. I also hope this is a good illustration for you about how we can better understand how the system works in general by just playing around with it. Often when there's something that you feel like you don't fully understand, write a program, test it out, get it in a debugger, look at where things are being put in memory, what the addresses are, and this can really help provide some clarity in issues that may seem a little murky for you. So thanks for watching, drop it a like if it was useful, and of course, happy holidays. 2020 has been a rough year, but thank you for being part of this channel and helping to support the work that I'm trying to do. I'm definitely looking forward to a better 2021 with lots of programming videos and learning and you becoming a stronger programmer, and until then, I will see you later.